Wow, what energy you guys have. Woof. <laughs> what a great crowd as well. Everyone's nice and cheerful and upbeat. I, I was really worried. After lunch crowd does not feel like an after lunch crowd. So thank you for being so warm with your welcome. Now I've got a clicker, so we'll see how this goes. Um, as you know, or as, as you've just heard, my name's Alex Young and I'm an ex Formula One driver, been in motorsports for many years now. I made a career of it. Um, let me see if I can just get to the right page. There we go. So here are some of my stats. Um, like I said, did Formula One. Very fortunate to have quite a long career. Uh, after Formula One, I went to America, raced in Australia, I did A1GP, I've done oval racing. Maybe this, I've just done quite a bit of racing all around the world. If anything, um, to put it simply, you'd probably call me a journeyman driver, someone that's just traveled the world and not really reached the highest, highest level. I was never formed the one world champion, for example, but had a, had a pretty good career by all intents and purposes. Um, also, so today what we're really talking about is um, dreams, really, and how to accelerate dreams. Um, and that's really what my whole career has been about, and that's what, that's what we're doing in Axel Sports. You see at the bottom of the thing, the founder of Axel Sports, that's a company I'm working on right now, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to realize dreams, we're trying to accelerate dreams. But first, to give you a bit of background, I have to talk a bit about where I come from, or came from. Um, you know, growing up in Malaysia in the 80s, you know, Formula One was a very distant dream. I was very fortunate because I came from a family that did motorsports. My father was uh, the general manager for the Batutika track for 10 years, from 88 to 98. And um, we did rally. In fact, the slide on the, on the far left, that's me in one of the rubber estates, or maybe a palm oil estates in uh, Sungabulo, I think, waiting for the rally cars to come over in the evening. And, and you know, those days, we were up there at 3 o'clock in the morning watching rally cars on stage. So I grew up in that sort of environment. My dad's the next one over. That's me in 93 doing a touring car race. And on the far right, that's my mom. My mom also did some racing as well. So I was very fortunate to be in part of that environment. You know, the environment is very important. If I didn't have that environment, I would never have got to where I am now. But I knew from motor racing, you know, we were arrogant, I suppose, or um, what's the right word? Adventurous enough to want to go to Formula One. Because I realized Formula One was the peak. But the problem is, growing up then, we didn't have Formula One on TV, you know? We'd only be able to read about it in the Star or the NST the very next day. In fact, to watch Formula One races, we'd watch it about six months too late in the uh, 80s and early 90s. People would come back into the country for these races and they'd bring a VHS tape and that's the only way we could watch Formula One. So we really knew nothing about trying to get to Formula One. But I did do some racing and we had some success. We were winning a lot of touring car races. But we were like, what's the next step? How do we go to the next thing, which is the dream of Formula One. And um, this is what we, we found out. It's very expensive. It takes 10 to 14 years to reach Formula One. Let's say 10 years on a short time frame. And it's a lot of money, you know, it costs about 8 to 10 million euros to reach a point where they can be considered for Formula One. You see all the step ladders. You start with karting, you start with junior racing, you try and get to, in nowadays, Formula Three, to Formula Two, and then get to Formula One. So it's prohibitively expensive. But, you know, we weren't going to let that, that um, stop our dream. And, and one of the first things we realized was we need to see challenges instead of obstacles. Um, and, and part of that, the first obstacle we had in the way was there were no, um, no, no former cars in, in Asia at all. Because to go to Formula One, you need to be able to drive former cars or single-seater cars. So what we did was, well, let's make our own ones. And that's what we did. We did former cars. We, we actually built these cars in the UK, flew them over to Southeast Asia, and ran a former Asia championship from, um, actually we started in 94, and it went on to, to about 2002, these single seaters. And literally the dream, the idea of bringing Formula cars to Malaysia was dreamt up in, I think, November of 1993, and we had our first car at Shah Alam in, I think, June of 1994. So, but this is the sort of dynamic thinking we need to try and make it happen. You know, and I have to say, my father was a large part of this. He was, he was always a, there's no such thing as impossible, we make it happen. So that's what happened. We, the former cars came here and, and we raced them, did pretty good. And this is a very important step because if I had had this first step, we would never have gone to Europe. Um, but by winning this championship, we were able to go to Europe and actually do some races. 
Um, and that, that was very important, obviously, because you, know, you can't go from zero to 100 and go straight to Europe. Um, and of course, the costs were very high. You know, so luckily in those days, I was able to find some sponsorship. Silver Sun Tires actually sponsored me. Uh, does anyone remember what Silver Sun Tires is? Yeah. Yeah, I think they're gone now. I think they bought, they're bought by Toyo, I think. Um, and anyway, they're, they're no longer there. But they were a really good supporter. They got me to, um, to, to Europe. But then there were obviously other obstacles along, along the way. Um, one, of course, was the late 90s economy crash. This was a bad one for us because the pound went from four and a half ringgit to the pound to nine ringgit to the pound. So suddenly budgets doubled um, and that made it very tricky. Um, and this is a tough time for us obviously because sponsorship is all gone and we're just trying to borrow money to keep going. And to make things worse, um, you know, sometimes have other obstacles because this is motor racing and in motor racing anything can happen. So this happened at Spa. I was just talking to it about it with Dato just now that uh, with this accident I actually had um, uh, Sir Sid Watkins actually pull me out of, the, well, out of the car. You can see there's a big hole in the side of the chassis, it's got the tires gone through um, and I lost my ACL and my knee um, and uh, yeah, it's, um, uh, yeah, so you know it's quite fun waking up in hospital actually. Well it wasn't fun waking up in hospital because the, the funny thing is I wasn't worried about my, my health, I was worried about the damage to the car because that car cost a lot of money and suddenly knocked us back. So, um, and uh, another question earlier on was about fear. Funnily enough, I felt no fear at this stage. I was just trying to get back into the race car because the, the hole was, the danger for me was uh, no money and the career maybe coming to an end. Um, and that's the thing about dreams sometimes, they take over your life where safety is not even a consideration. Uh, I don't regret it because it helped me get to where we want. And literally, uh, actually, I was back in the car six weeks, actually. We had another race in Italy, in Misano. I was back in the car, I think, six weeks later. With crutches still, but, you know, in those days they were not so concerned. Um, a bit more concerned now. But, um, yeah, so this was tough for us. Um, and I remember this quote by Michael Jordan. It's a good one, you know. It's about taking as many shots as possible. Um, and I don't know how we continued on at that time because it was very tough. You know, the money was tight. I had to go to Japan to race because um, I found some sponsorship. Well, I didn't find sponsorship. They they allowed. We, we found a drive that was subsidized, so we were in Japan to race for a couple of seasons. But you know, it was difficult, and I was very happy that we had hung in there because you know, eventually this happened, which was you know, I got a test in a Formula One car in Mugello in uh, 2001, um, and that's, that's part of the game really, is making sure you still stay in the game somehow. Uh, the test went very well, and um, as Rizal mentioned, we made Formula 1 in 2001. So, that's the field. Uh, I think I'm on, the far, yeah, I'm on the far right, not total far right. Total far right is my teammate, that was Fernando Alonso, who's still driving today. So, yeah, very good teammate in fact. Um, but yeah, it was, a, it, was, it was a dream come true, really, you know, making Formula 1. So that's all I can say is about accelerating dreams. You, you don't give up, you know. If you, you have fussy obstacles, no car, build your own car. No money, borrow money. <laughs> and take a long time to pay it off. Um, uh, have an accent, get back up. You know, these are the things that... You've got to stay in the game somehow. There are all, always obstacles. But if you're not in the game, if you're not in the race, then your chances of succeeding are zero. So, a bit about my former one years. Um, interestingly enough, I never felt they were a success because people always said to me, I want, you must be so happy to reach Formula One. But I never felt that way because my dream was to become Formula One World Champion. My dream wasn't to make Formula One. So, Formula One for me, in many ways, I didn't achieve my dream. But, I have to say, obviously, there was a lot of great things about it. Um, and I learned a lot, which we're trying to apply today, you know. We're trying to accelerate dreams of other people. You know, accelerate dreams of what we're trying to do with the business world now. And that's very important. Those, those, those learnings you learn along the way. Whoops. That went a bit quick. Okay, so that's what we're doing now, Access Sports. And this is part of the, the lessons we've learned is in motor racing, we saw the first earlier slide how expensive it was. 10 million euros 
over 10 years to try and get to Formula 1. That's not even to get you into Formula 1. That's just to get you far up the education level to be considered for Formula 1. You have to get into Formula 1, it's even more money, or you have to be in the right team, the right program. So we've been looking at trying to find solutions to try and accelerate the learning curve. And I have to say, I think we've found it, and that's through sim racing. Um, so a combination of sim racing, the driver academies we now do, we can now take guys from the virtual world to the real world in a very quick time. And uh, we actually, instead of having 10 years of education, we can now compress everything into two years on a simulator. And we, this is very interesting, because the world is waking up to the importance of simulator racing for, for motorsports, but they don't realize yet how strong it is. We still get a lot of motorsport people thinking, yeah, sim racing is good, but they're not really, they're not really seeing what's possible. And that's one, one of the things we're finding with it is because we now have much more access to a larger pool of people, because if you think about it, when I was trying to make Formula One, I was the only driver from Malaysia trying to make that dream. And I was the only driver with the resources and the environment to make that dream. So only one person. That's a talent pool of one. Chances of getting someone that's very talented with a talent pool of one, not very high. Nowadays, you know, when I was in Formula One, maybe you had about 10 kids coming into karting. So that's suddenly a talent pool of 10. Again, not very high. Now with sim racing, we've got a talent pool of thousands. You know, we've got, we've got real talent coming through. And that's what I want to talk to you about today is through simulator racing, trying to find different opportunities, we can find talent far superior than me on the sort of level that you see in Formula One today. Fernando Alonso is a perfect example. You know, he's really a talent. That's why he's lasted so long. So that's what makes it so exciting about sim racing and trying to condense a 10-year training program into two years on the sim. So, obviously, I like this slide because it's something I always talk about. People always talk about passion, but I always say to them, it's never about passion. Passion is never enough. If you really want to succeed in something as difficult as this, you need to be obsessed by it. And I'm sure many of you guys know the difference. You know, you're all passionate people. But I'm sure you also see where the lines get blurred between passion and obsession when all you do is think about how to be better. That's right, that's right. Correct? Yeah. yeah, we all want to be better. We all want to achieve our full potential. That's what all of you are doing here today, achieving, helping people achieve their full potential. And you, don't, you don't find those answers if you're just passionate about it. You have to be obsessed by it. Okay, I'm going to show you a quick eSport race just to show you a bit of a video because I told videos are good. And that. we are underway, a nice first call, oh. and in go Anton, he's going to win his first race. We're running championships all throughout the Pacific, we need a premier championship, proper production, proper entry fees, and prize money. That's what we want championship. We want championship really levels of playing field. We made a great start on the e race, and it allows people in the real life teams and sim racing teams to compete with even footy, and they can be competitive against each other. The level of racing is really, really high. So, so we have the exporting competition. We want to make the racing even harder and more realistic. In race room, the drivers and teams have learned how to have contact without breaking the car. The eye racing has been much more delicate. We have so many incidents on the track that we have a couple of races. Fans are competing for the last two rounds. New one's going to get bigger and better all the time. That's going to become a global championship. We're going to get more European teams and drivers taking part as well. Okay, that's E1 Championship. That's a championship we uh, promoted and organized over the last three years. Because it's not just about coaching, you've got to give guys a platform to excel. You know, um, if you cannot have a top championship in the region, how do you tell if the driver's any good? So in our last E1 Championship, we had Williams Esports and Mumbai Falcons, top real life teams competing in our com competition. And you just got to raise that level. That's the only different way you can tell let the cream rise to the crop and see how good our, our drivers are. So that's very important to try and do. It's not just about the coaching, you have to have the platforms as well. So a couple of case studies, yeah, just to sh show that I'm, I know what I'm talking about. This is uh, Mohammed Ali, he's from Singapore, and he's a pure sim driver. He's been doing sim driving since 2010. And on the right is him testing a Formula Renault. He's never driven Sipam. He's never even seen Sipam before from a track and he's never driven this car before. So he won a prize with us, and he drove this car for the first time. And I told him, he's on very old tires, 200 kilometer tires. I said, the best lap you can do is a 209, maybe a 208 if you're lucky. 
His first day, I think in his second, ten, second one hour session, he did a 207. Quicker than what I would expect a real life driver to do. And he's never seen the track, never driven this car before. But he's just purely been a sim racer. Perfect example, and you see him, he's fighting the car, he's not driving slow, while he's fighting with the wheel and stuff. And that is what I, I have seen, because when I first started this, people would always say, can sim drivers be as good as real life drivers? And my answer was always like, eh, yeah, I think so, I think so. But now I've done this, my, my answer is very different. When people ask me that, I say, no, in, here in Asia Pacific, our sim drivers are much better than real life drivers, much better. And that's because here in Malaysia, real life drivers, they just drive um, 1.6 touring cars and they only drive in Sepang. You know, our sim drivers drive all around the world from Le Mans to Nürburgring to Indianapolis to Monaco and they drive different cars from touring cars to single seaters to Formula One to prototype. So you learn many different skills and different techniques. So they're far more complete drivers when they make it into real life. Um, my second case study is a guy here with us today, Nakib Aslam. He's a Malaysian, and he's even more incredible if you ask me, because he only started sim driving in 2019. So sim driving in 2019, and this is why I, I want to um, bring him up in a second. Because the talent to just go from sim driving to real life driving, he started real life driving in, when was this, 2021? 2021, with Toyota. And he won four out of six races against proper, you know, drivers coming up of his caliber. Yeah. Okay, now, clap has come. Why don't you come up now, Naki? Let's give Naki a warm welcome! Yes. I just want to just finish off the introduction. He also won the Sipang 1000 kilometers in November last year. That's the biggest car race in Malaysia. So, Naki, good to have you here. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, hi. Uh, as Alex said, my name is Naki Bazla. Started sim racing at 2019 and by 2021 started real life racing. Um, all thanks to this man here. I think this, yeah, the story really started off, as stated before, with a passion. I had a huge passion for cars, huge passion for racing. Um, but I was very, I lived, I grew up very differently to Alex. Uh, I was much more realistic, I was much more conservative. So the dream of becoming a real life driver never seemed possible to me. Up until 2020, when the huge, when the pandemic happened and sim racing took a huge hit, a um, huge blow up, sorry. Uh, I saw the potential, I saw Alex was the one posting it, and I thought, who else better to impress than this guy in this country? <laughs> so, yeah, decided to get into it, obviously, how I perform must have impressed him because we've been working together ever since. Yeah. And absolutely, and, and people often ask about that transition. Was the transition hard to go from sim racing to real life driving? Yeah, I was being asked that a couple of times before. Like today, it's really surprising of what we learn in simulated driving, how much can be transferred into the real world. Um, and it's crazy that, you know, nowadays you see more and more drivers from simulator coming to the real world because what we do in the simulator with the steering wheel, with the how we press the throttle and whatnot, it's completely transferable into the real world. So the moment I stepped into a racing car for the first time, only starting sim racing about a year on, it felt completely natural to me. It, it felt completely at home and yeah. And um, now now you're getting into, into real life driving. You've won races in your first two years. Let's talk about once upon 1,000 kilometers. What's your dream now? But where, where do you want to go? So, if you ask me, like three years ago, where I am right now is pretty much where I wanted to be, just doing real life racing. But now we've seen the potential. We've seen the potential of what sim racing can do and what the potential we have from the capacity that we got. I think sky's the limit. I mean, anything can be possible right now. For me, my personal dream because I've got Toyota a good relationship with them, endurance racing at the 24 hour Mon, you know, following the footsteps, doing it for real, and yeah, I think that will be the main goal. Okay, thank you very much. Give a round of applause for Naki. Thank you. Um, that's pretty much it, I think. Um, but yes, just a 
carry on when I keep saying he's already a world-class driver. We did a race called 24 Hours of Le Mans virtual, um, and we finished fourth. And this was against peak Formula One teams like Mercedes, Red Bull, um, prototype teams like Porsche, BMW, all the top teams in the world. We finished fourth in the world. This is a race Max Verstappen took place in, took part in. Nat Lando Norris, Charles Leclerc, Fernando Alonso. So this is a real cream of the crop of real life drivers and sim drivers, and we finished fourth. Um, and to be honest, Nakiba was one of the outstanding drivers on that day. So he's already world class um, on the sim world. He's getting there in the real world. I think nationally he's already there. But the next step is to go international again and somehow find a way to get to a, become a world champion one day. And I think that's possible, but we do need support and help from everyone in the community. But at least we are finding ways to shortcut, to accelerate the dreams, really, to make sure that we can try and get it as cheaply and as um, powerful as possible. And I think that's about it. So uh, we'll go to the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Another round of applause to Alex Young. And also Naki Baslan, thank you so much. Wow, um, guys, every time I listen to this story, even though I've seen it many, many times already, I still am inspired, I'm still moved. Uh, but most of you that don't know, actually Naki drove for my team in Gokas, and uh, when he came into my team, he had the uh, eye of the tiger. The guy is definitely a winner, and he helped me and my team win and we were in podium positions and whatnot. So I know this guy is uh, going to be the future of Malaysian motorsports. Okay, so as a token appreciation, I want to call on Gish. We have a special gift for Alex. Let's go. Thank you. Yes, brilliant. I'd like, to, I'd like to have Rizal to pass this over because uh, this, this will be more meaningful. Yeah, so can I just invite Rizal to pass this uh, on behalf of uh, the convention uh, to Alex. Once again, a round of applause, Alex Young. Fire away, can I still be an F1 driver? Oh, so we've got uh, there, Zorab. Zorab, okay. Zorab! Zorab, come, come over, come over. So we're gonna pass the mic, yeah? Okay. Zorab, for those who know who attended the convention last year, whenever we see Zorab, what do we say? Go! Yes, go. Okay, Zorab, so your chance to score a goal now, okay? Okay, there's no battery, you can come here. It's working. Yeah, right, you can push it. Go, go, go. 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 It's a long, a long answer to that question. Um, I'll start with the simple part, I think, which is I don't feel I've stopped. I'm still pushing. Um, okay, the, the racetrack may not be an actual racetrack, it might not be an actual car, but I'm pushing in the business sense. With the competitions we do, with the drivers we have, we're still pushing 100%, um, and we're using every minute of every day trying to push that. Still obsessed by it. So that's the easy thing. I don't feel there has been a transition. We're just focusing on different tools. It's, it's a different car, it's a different track, but it's the same thought process. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, we've got a few. Oh, we've got a few. So the lady first. Uh, let's go. This may sound like just a, what kind of silly question, but I want to ask you, does fear ever come into you? at any point, at the beginning or at any stage? Yes, especially in the beginning, obviously, there's a lot of fear. Um, like I said, fear of safety or life was one of my least fears. The biggest fears was fear of um, shame, fear of failure, fear of not ma making it. Um, you know, when you're millions of dollars in debt, you know, that, that can be quite 
quite burdening. Um, but you know, it's it's a, I'm sure you guys talk about it as well. It's about changing things and how they're positioned or framed in your mind. You know, what can I control? What can I do? And what is actually so fearful about it? What's the worst thing that can happen? So. Maybe it's not a good mindset in many ways because it's a big risk mindset. Yeah. If I hadn't made it, then you know, be penniless and in a, in a lot of trouble. But maybe I'd have found another way to overcome that as well. You know, it, it's about framing it differently and, and seeing it as a as a challenge, really. Um, the other thing I also discovered much later is is really embracing what you're fearful about because one of the things you're taught in sports psychology is to always be positive. Always, always be positive. Always think you're going to win and be positive and never be negative. And I realized that was also fearful. Because then you're fearful of being negative. And that means you have got fear. So truly be fear free from fear. You need to not be scared of everything. And that means negativity as well. So I, I learned to embrace negativity. It was a very useful tool. Flip side of the same coin. So that really was a big game changer for me. You know, I could say, yeah, yeah, I'm so some of crap. But it didn't mean I believed in it. Actually, I, I, I learned a way for words not to have meaning if I chose them not to have meaning. And in that way, um, even though I said it, it didn't impact me, I'm still going to go there and try and win the race. And I found that very important. So embracing negativity and fear, as frightening as it sounds, and it took a while because it's quite scary. It is scary. But it, it does help you uh, minimize that fear. I mean, it's something you have to work with all the time, but, but that's, that's what worked for me. Brilliant. We've got one more room for one more question. So I'm going to, I don't know, you've already asked him a lot of questions now during coffee session downstairs. There's like 25 questions he asked her. So we're going to go over there. Okay, so uh, let's go. Angela. Angela, yes. Alex, um, many people put, uh, talk, say, our oh, well, um, I think it has to do with our world as well as the sports world. No one that is so talented. If you put talent and hard work in comparison, how much is talent and how much is hard work out of zero to ten? How much, you know, zero to ten, how much, what is the percentage in your opinion on talent? And how much is the percentage in your opinion on um, hard work? Hard work, determination, yes. yeah, that, that sort of stuff. Thank you. Uh, I think it depends on the sport. If you're looking at something like tennis, where you have a very established sport and you have thousands upon thousands of thousands of people doing tennis, I think they're equally important because you don't reach the top without having equal measure of both. Something like motorsports, in my case, hard work outweighs talent 10 to 1. You know what I mean? Because you're from a much smaller pool and a lot of motorsports, you, People think there are thousands and thousands of people driving and really see the pinnacle. We don't see that. Very few people get into, into, into driving. So uh, in, 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 in motorsports, if you ask me, hard work is much more important. Paying attention to deal, small details, going out and selling yourself, getting yourself the drive, um, having that right sponsor. So it's, it's much more different. That's why I like esports. Esports is democratizing. You know, we get a much pooler of people. And that's why I bring Nakib here, because you know, this is a driver with equal amount of talent and hard work. You know, and that's why I know he's going to go far further than I could have, or a lot of other contemporary drivers we see out there today. All right, thank you so much uh, for the amazing question. And Alex, and thank you for spending time answering the question. Guys, please, one more round of applause to Mr. Alex Young. Living amazing legend. Thank you.